So thank you so much. And well, I will thank John for her words. And I'm really humbled uh, for not only for the award, but for all of you being here. Uh, before I start, I also would like to acknowledge this sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, it has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years, and this land is the territory of the huron wendat the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. So thank you to the land, too. There are so many people that I have to thank that I'm I mean, the list is really huge. But first of all, I, I have to dedicate also my thesis to my supervisor, Jan, Jan Angus, because without her support from before coming to Canada until now, I would have never, ever been here. I have to thank the participants, the, my community partners, that they were, they were, I just saw them before um, coming here. And they were coming with me, but they had to stay at Sketch. So my community, my community partners also, uh, they've been like, uh, like a huge, huge help, and thank you to all the volunteers, the artists, everybody that has made this possible, and also to my funders. And now I'm going to start um, backwards. So I'm going to start with the result of the study. So. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> So I said I was starting backwards. So that's the what I would call the main result of my study. It's one of the results, though, 
there are more, but that's the main result for me. This is not the program that I started, this is the evolution. So this is, uh, mm, I lost count, I think we are in the sixth, in the sixth, sixth round of the, of the program. So you'll see how we got there, how we got to this result, starting from just a thinking research question with all, mm, all the comments. So this is a program that you will, I will introduce it at the end. I'm introducing it now, just in case I talk too much and I cannot make it <laughs> to explain to you the results of the program. No, I'm joking. So this is a program that came from linking theory to practice. So it didn't come or it's not the result of how am I going to do an intervention to help young moms. No, it didn't come that way. It only came from the will of putting theory into practice and making it work. So let me introduce you to um, the young mothers and what is mothering at a young age, just to help you understand a little bit the context. So young mothers who have low resources and their children, it's known that they have worse health outcomes than more resource counterparts. So there's literature on their health, their studies studying their health and healthcare utilization but these studies are very scarce in comparison to studies that mm, are done on older mothers or on young people who are experiencing homeless, for example. But there's no a lot of studies on young mothers with low resources. Having poor health outcomes demands on healthcare resources to address the situation. But do the present resources that we have available really reach this group of young mothers? And what are the health practices of these young mothers when they take care of their children and their own health? What do they do and what is being done for them? Available studies show that, as I said, that they have worse health outcomes. And when I, when I say worse health out outcomes, I mean worse mental, mental health, more custody issues, and it has been shown a direct relation between having housing issues or experiencing homelessness or being at risk of being homeless and young people's mental health. But young mothers, as well as teen pregnancies, are shown in the literature to put their well-being and the well-being of their children at risk. And their future, the future of the young mothers and of their children is linked to poverty and low income. So regarding the approaches and frameworks used in this studies or these few studies done on the health of young mothers, we see that most of the studies focus on linear re relations and ignore the relation between social context and healthcare utilization. These studies were rooted in a more dominant narrative that problematizes young motherhood and it also problematizes young people with low resources. So what are the studies taking into account the social world? and the implications of social structures on the access to and the use of healthcare resources. <clears throat> I, to understand that, I based my work on Pierre Bourdieu's theory of practice. But why did I choose Bourdieu? You know, there are many theories. I could have chosen any other one, uh, more modern ones, more trendy ones, but no, I chose Bourdieu. But why? So, there are several reasons, but from, from my point of view, individual actions, and in this, in this, now I'm referring to individual health practices, or so what we do to take care of ourselves, or in this case, what young mothers do to take care of themselves and take care of their children. These individual actions are not the exclusive result of choices, of individual choices or personalities, but they also relate strongly to the social world. So the actions taken to take care of our own health as individuals are also related to a bigger structure. Bourdieu's work on the relation between individual behaviors and the social structures, as well as his rejection of the duality that might exist or it's said to exist between objectivism and, subject and sub subjectivism, provided a theoretical framework for me to pursue my research. So I wanted to use the relational approach in my study. This is a complex issue to study, the one I just briefly introduced, but why is it complex? So the complexity relies mainly on the different and the non-full understanding of the health situation of young women 
who are mothering at a young age. There have been studies looking at the linear relation, as I just mentioned, mentioned and sci scientists have studied also pregnancy and risky sexual behaviors, and they've identified factors related to having a worse health. But these, all these interests shadow the understanding of why this is happening, how this is happening, and why this is a situation and a story that keeps repeating since itself. This is not something new. There is no much understanding on how the way that the social world is organized relates to our health. It's about not blaming individuals for what is considered a choice or an individual action. As Bourdieu explained, and this is one of the aspects of this theory that caught my attention at the beginning, is that what are seen as individual actions and health practices as such are not the exclusive result of choices that the person made, or, as I said, not a result of personalities, but behaviors relate to the social world and how others behave. So, to understand whether healthcare utilization by an extremely vulnerable population relates to social structure, as I needed a strong social theory like Bourdieu. Also, there's a difference between doing research for people and doing it with people. This is not a new idea. This is not something that you've never heard of. But this is something that we haven't fully resolved yet. In more traditional ways of research, and I mean obviously quantitative approaches or mixed, me mixed methods approach, uh, this translates to looking at participatory methods or patient and public engagement strategies or even knowledge mobilization. But my idea is that there's another way of doing research with vulnerable populations. There's a relational approach that focuses on relations and on finding the methods that let you understand that. And this is possible when theory guides our practice, which I particularly embody when using a NARS-based approach. Theory guiding research practice brought me to one of the most basic and first questions in my story as a researcher, that is, why am I doing this? Why am I doing research? And how am I doing it? Studying the health practices of young women through a relational approach took me to situate myself in the social world, and especially in the academic field. I will avoid you the details of this analysis and my social academic position. I'm open to discuss it later. But as a summary, and beyond my, my predisposition or my gender lens, there are values attached to the reasons that drive my motivation to do research. I could be simplistic and call these values justice or fairness, but these are not fully suitable. However, it's right that there is something else, that there's that giving back factor, which bugged me when I was planning this research. It was the, why am I doing it? Am I pursuing understanding? I'm at do I want knowledge? So in my thoughts, Bourdieu's criticism of the academic field pushed me further and pushed my thinking to find a way of designing and doing research while being coherent with theory. Based on Bourdieu's principle of doing meaningful research or better, don't do anything, and also based on Bourdieu's views of what counts as data, I chose an arts-based approach to study women mothering at a young age. And I'm not gonna stand on what counts as data because again, I could be talking until 2 p.m. <laughs> but just a quick note that I use the approach of, um, as Bordio said, um, banal data. The data that is the daily data or as Sarah Pink uh, uses mundane data or as John Eakin says, all is data or as I like to say, there's no data. <laughs> so that's my approach. But also, I'm happy to discuss it later. So I'm not going to do a, like a speed course on Bourdieu, but I just want to mention three concepts that I used, and they were key in my whole process. I use these concepts as tools. So it was theory, but they are tools. And remember that concepts are like colors. That's what I put the pictures. All the pictures that you see come from the research, the, the study, and all the pictures are taken by myself, so no copyright issues. So concepts are like colors. When you think of red or of yellow, 
you don't think of red and yellow in an abstract way. You think of a yellow car or of a red tomato. So that's how you think about concepts. And that's the way that when we think about theoretical concepts or complex concepts, that's the way that we work. You don't think about habitus. It's impossible. You think about habitus in a specific context and you put it to work. And it's when you put it to work mm -hmm. that that makes effect and it really helps your thinking and the analysis. So just let me introduce you to three concepts, three Bourdieu concepts that I mean the most of you may know. Symbolic violence, habitus, and capital. Symbolic, habit, symbolic violence is crucial to understand young mothers and to understand how they are complicit in their own oppression. So symbolic violence takes the form of toxic assumptions that impact healthcare utilization and it helps explain how their behaviors result from internalizing the structures that frame them as a person that have a mismanaged life. This mismanaged, mismanaged life concept is something that came that comes up usually in but frequently in either the, the literature or uh, the printed and social media. You, you will see how this developed later. Uh, habitus. Habitus is a little bit more complicated, but it's a pre-reflexive set of dispositions to act that is conditioned by social context. But at the, at the same time, has the ability to modify norms and values. And in my discussions with the Yan, I don't know that I won't see her. So in my, dis in my discussion with the Yan, we used to, to um, explain habitus as water. So habitus is like water. If you think about the water in a stream, the water takes the shape of whatever it is. The stream is narrow, the shape is not, the water is narrow, the stream is white, the water goes wider. But if you let the stream run for years and years and years, the water will modify the stones and will change the shape of the stones. So water takes any shape, but it also has the ability to change. So it's the same with habitus, with our practices, with what we do for being the person that we are. We do that because we belong to a certain social group or to more than one social group, and that's what we do. But also, this is not determined. Our practices have the ability of changing the structure and make a social change. So that's the complexity of habitus, but it's a very powerful and amazing concept. Capital. Capital is, are the resources implying some kind of power that can be traded for symbolic capital in the pursuit of a better position in the social field. So it are all these resources that can be traded for being in a better social place. So all of this led me uh, to my purpose. And in this study, I wanted to examine the social positioning of young mothers with low resources and how these related to their use of and access to healthcare resources. There are five questions that guided my thinking that I wanted to if we can read them, but I would like to move to um, the study uh, per se. So the design I use for this study was a discursive montage. What is a discursive montage? It sounds very complicated, but it's not. It's an analysis of different perspectives on a social phenomenon that characterized by the by including different types of material in the form of documents, in the form of images, interviews, individual interviews, recitation interviews, reports, journals, news, blogs. I think I'm not trying any of all these different types of media. So again, why? Why a discursive montage? Why not doing something more easy or straight? The discursive montage aim to capture different points of view from individuals and from the social world. As it's not possible to capture the point of view from all different positions in the social world, or maybe it is, I don't want to say that it's not, but it would take me like 55 PhDs, <laughs> which I'm happy to do that, but I, I wouldn't pay my bills, so I don't. <laughs> so Bourdieu also introduced and explained that values and norms that belong to the structure are transferred and are visible through the social organization. So when we want to study social norms and values, it's not that we are studying something that doesn't exist, that you cannot see. 
It's just the opposite. It's something that is part of the mundane, the banal, the old data, and that there's no data. These values and norms are reflected in the public discourses, in the public narratives. And these are found in the different channels of communication that they are used broadly. In produced times, that was pretty easy. In 20 years ago, channels of communication were mainly TV, TV, radio, newspapers. So I was narrow. However, now it's a bit different. And to understand the relations between the views of young mothers and the values and views of the social world, we need different research strategies. We need strategies that capture the narratives of the media, including social media and internet. And it also means that we need strategies to get to the vulnerable populations. So something else than talking to the participants. Strategies that connect young mothers, in this case with us researchers, to engage in a process of co-constructing knowledge not of creating knowledge. For that, I use a NARS-based approach with a combination of three methods. Three methods. And these are the three methods, methods that I use. First, an analysis of the media artifacts. Second, a graphic elicitation. And third, my sketchbook. The analysis of the media artifacts, and when I say media artifacts, uh, I consider media as a channel of normalization, of reproduction of inequalities, and also as a channel of resistance. And this means, again, printed media, like newspapers that are available um, online or printed in paper, blogs, websites, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, video, email, and Pinterest. And I excluded Twitter, um, because Twitter has a different method, a different way of analysis and easily the extraction of data is a little bit more complex. So I focus on this, maybe on my plus one, you can do a Twitter analysis. <laughs> the second uh, method I used was a graphic elicitation. Graphic elicitation entailed two individual interviews. The first one was an individual interview, and the second one that happened after the first one, sometimes it happened a few days after, sometimes happened two, three weeks after. The elicitation interview uh, was based on the participants' artwork, so on the on the artistic pieces that they created for themselves and for the purpose of the research. I will explain to you in the next slide. And also my sketchbook, but I will also explain two slides after, that my sketchbook was my observational and reflexive interpretive strategy. So you may ask yourself, Clara, how did you get the artwork? Did they just come and draw for you and you just interview them and they draw and paint or did they paint at home and they came back? Remember, they had low resources. So painting at home is not something that really works. So I had to think something else. But I have to acknowledge that I thought about that at the beginning and Jan, my supervisor, and Janet and Diane knows, but uh, I never thought it was going to be so complex. So at the beginning, I thought, oh, they are going to, make art for me, we're going to do art together, and then we're going to do the recitation interview. But that became extremely complicated, not only because of the physical place when, where they had to draw, but there's no need to say that in order to produce something that is meaningful for you, you need a safe space. If not, it's very complicated to focus on producing an art piece or to expressing yourself. Uh, added to that, the recruitment process was not easy. As I will explain later, the recruitment, the recruitment process and trying to get to them was a clear refre reflection of the symbolic violence that these participants experience. And I will unpack um, later. So in order to facilitate and to give them a space and the skills they needed to produce something, I had to create some workshops from them, for them. So I start a partnership with uh, four community, mm, with four community partners that offer services to youth or to young mothers or to homeless youth. And once we built this partnership that it took us a minimum of six months, we started designing <coughs> workshops that the, the young mothers could come as a drop-in and then they will they would find resources 
to be creative. And when I say resources, but like what exactly? Any type of mixed media, volunteer artists, professional artists that came and taught them the basic skills if they wanted uh, to learn them, tokens, mm, food, that was the main important, the most important thing, and uh, childcare. So these workshops were really crucial for the success of the research. Without that, there would have been no research at all because it allowed the prolonged engagement with the participants and also with the community partners. Also, from my epistemological views and due to my past experiences, doing research must not only pursue my aims and interests, but must also genuinely respect participants. So in the case of young mothers with low resources, their extreme vulnerability demanded of a design that offered them something. For this purpose, I build this partnership with the organizations and provide, and provide this apps program to foster creativity in a safe space. And the moms, they had the opportunity to learn artistic skills and create. And to the workshop, not only my participants came, I mean, my participants were half of the population that came to the workshops. The populations were, the workshops were open to any young mother or father that was looking for or needed a safe space to be creative. And when I say to be creative, I not only mean to draw and paint. I mean, we were knitting, drawing, painting, just talking, doing collages, and we started to cook pretty fast. I mean, after the first two weeks, the need for learning how to cook also came up. And that's also culinary, it's culinary art. So it's part of this of this need uh, of new skills. I ran the workshops at two different sites. Uh, for the purpose of the research, in one site for 12 weeks, two hours every week, and on the other side, uh, three sessions, but they were three to four hours each. The reason that we only ran three sessions on the other side it was because the population at that side, the one, the population that were coming, were much more vulnerable than the, the ones that were on the west end. So the ones on the east end were much more vulnerable. And um, if we if we had done more sessions, there were um, more risk attached for them. So we put them under their petition. We did only three sessions, and they were three to four hours each. The structure of the se the sessions. Uh, was none. So there was no structure of the sessions. Not at the beginning. You can't imagine how beautiful it was my structure of the session. I submitted to the REB, I submitted to my committee, I defended my proposal, and it looked really good. I was so proud of the structure of the session, but it didn't work. So <laughs> I had, after the first workshop, I had just to put it aside and said, okay, that's my structure of the session, it's not their structure of the session, but it's different. <laughs> so I had to be flexible and quick to just omit that and just go with the flow. Go with the flow doesn't mean that we're going crazy, we're going to do whatever we're going to do in the workshop as long as we draw. No. So the goal was clear and the agreement between the participants, the partners and myself was very clear. So we know, we knew what we wanted and we knew what we had and we knew where we did not want to go. After knowing that, anything else in the middle is flexible. It's like going from here to Vancouver. You know where you want to get, but you don't have an idea how long it's going to take or how you're going to get there or how many stops you're going to take. So it was the same process. But it took time. It evolved. It changed. We incorporated uh, the ideas. The youth have grown. Some of the youth now are leaders in the group. and. What we got is what I show you in the in the video. What about my schedule? So Clara, you mentioned a third method. These two seem these two methods seem pretty traditional. You, you mentioned that you were doing something different. Okay. My schedule was the third method. So the participants and I draw and paint and even collage and knit, as I mentioned. But I also use drawing as my reflexive process. So as part of the, all, mm, the reflexivity embedded in the study. Choosing a sketching as my practice was not a random choice. This is based again on Bourdieu's theory. 
the same with Bourdieu, theory, drawing doesn't match, yes, it does. Bourdieu theory and his critique of the scholastic, of scholastic reason was crucial for that. This was based also on my reflection on where we or I personally am located in the academic world as a health researcher, as a nurse, as a woman, and again, as a qualitative critical arts based researcher. In my case, my training as a clinical nurse and my experience practicing nursing in the ICU and also my academic, professional and personal learning and life has shaped, shaped the way I view the world and in particular studies and the research world. For me, this reflexive practice is a tool to enhance the study, is a tool to develop the connection between mind and body when I'm analyzing the data. So Clara, you said there's no data. Okay, no, but there's something I have to analyze. So this is the tool I use, one of the tools I use for, analyze, for analyzing. And I use this tool when talking to participants, when developing connections with uh, the stakeholders and the partners, or when I'm designing the study. Drawing is the tool I used to see, as Cosi says. I did not see to draw something, but just the opposite. I first draw, and then I saw. I don't draw to capture reality or to reproduce reality. I just draw to see. In fact, I like the word sketching because it brings that component of unfinished work. Drawing is you're drawing something that you clearly see. When I sketch, it's unfinished because my focus is not in finishing a piece, but in the process of drawing, seeing, and reflecting. So the reflexive process also applies to when participants draw. The reflexive process, I realized at the end of the study that it was not only mine, but that also happened to them for good and for not as good as you'll see at the end. Let's see an example of my sketchbook. I call that the child's, sh child's shoe. It's not very original, but it is a child's shoe. So this shoe did not belong to any of the participants' children. But I saw this shoe on a pool bleacher on an evening after being all day with the participants. Transportation is a big issue for my participants, for attending health appointments or for going to school. They always choose walking versus other ways of transportation. It's cheaper and people bother them less. However, this is a deterrent for seeking health care. Shoes are so important. Shoes and strollers carry all the young mother's weight, the physical weight and the emotional weight. One story from the day I draw or I sketch this shoe. When one of the, my participants was coming to the workshop with her baby on the bus, the baby started crying. And the baby cried and cried for a while. And the bus driver asked the mom to leave the bus if the baby did not stop crying. She explained that this is not the first time that happened to her, and other mothers agreed. Traveling on the TTC is an issue, and drivers and passengers keep an eye on them, and they feel justified to judge them because they look really young. And I think, or I thought that day, would this bus driver have said the same to a 40-year-old mother, well-dressed with a crying baby? Would this bus driver have said that to a 30-year-old mother with her partner and a crying baby? It's hard to imagine, and I can, I can imagine a driver asking a 30 years old mom with a partner and a crying baby to step out of the bus. So I never heard of such a case. Young mothers are vulnerable when they are in the public spaces. The others are in a clear position of superiority, pushing them to the invisibility that ignores their existence and smashes their confidence. The public spaces push young mothers to invisibility, and this possesses them of the legitimacy of motherhood. It's a marginal, marginalizing social practice. Let me move forward and explain a little bit about the analytical process uh, that I did with a different type of data. So how did you analyze Clara, all that? Like, well, I use for this analysis that is a, re a relational analytical process. So following Bourdieu's approach, I followed a, pro a process of co-construction of knowledge with the participants and with the collaborators. And the collaborators means the community partners, the volunteers, including the artists. 
And why this? Why did I do that? My concern, that I, the concern I wanted to address, is the symbolic struggle in which the power of categorizing is at stake. So that's a bit complex. I don't think I have time to unpack it unless, again, I'm going to be talking until 2. And Sean, please let me know if I'm talking too much. But I'm also happy to um, further unpack this at the end or um, to talk about it further. So that sounds very nice, but Clara, what did you do? <laughs> so it was a dynamic process, non-linear process. As you saw, non-linear. I started with the results at the beginning, so it's something that I embody in my, in my whole life. But it was a non-linear process of that abstraction through this relational approach. Again, using Bourdieu's concepts as analytical thinking tools. And I organized that in three stages. First, a preparation phase of all the no data, the understanding of the structure of relations between participants and institutions, and an analysis of the participants' habitus in relation to their social position. And who were the participants of the study? Who were the young moms that help and got involved in this co-construction of knowledge. There were 13 women. They were aged at the moment of the study. They were, they were aged 18 to 26. And at the, time, at the time of the interviews. And the time of their first pregnancy was the following. Nine of them, they had the first pregnancy when they were 18 or, old or younger. So they were 16, 17, or 18, most of them. And four of them, they had the first pregnancy between 19 and 22. Where were they living? Uh, at that moment, the moment that we, they were engaged in the study, two were living in a shelter, two were living with family, two were living independently, and five were living with a partner. The partner was not always the, uh, the father of um, the children. It was the partner at the moment. All of them had experiences with the shelter uh, system, although only at that moment, only two of them was in the shelter. And all of them were low income or very low income. And what's the definition for me? What was the definition of low income or very low income? So at least one day a week uh, that they did not have money to get food or diapers or their housing condition was the result of not having enough income to afford stable and safe housing. So all the participants, all of them had very low social support. And I mean low social support means that they could not count on anybody in case of need, or they could count on one or two people, but they were not sure if they were, if they were able to locate them or find them or that those persons were able to, to help them. In total, I did 21 individual interviews. None of, nine of these 21 were elicitation interviews with the participants out of work. All the participants uh, that I interview attended the creative workshops with varying consistency. Varying consistency means that some attended for a few sessions, others attended all the sessions, others attended all the sessions and kept coming after I finished the study and now they are involved in the planification of the new sessions. So the level of engagement with the workshop varied. All of them had custody of their children and live with their children. And all of them were very difficult to find. To find, not mean to find them. I mean, the ones I found them and they were in my project, I knew nothing of them. So they never gave me the phone number. They had my phone number. They could, they call me at any time or they text me from random numbers, but they didn't want to be, find, to be found at all. They wanted to be in the shadow during the whole research process. Once I finished, that changed, but that was their choice. They didn't want me to contact them at all. So all these things, all these methods of data collection, the sketchbook, the media analysis, the interviews, the artwork, the licitation, what for? What did I do with all of that? Because that sounds really nice methodological innovation, different, but what for, what else? Did you get something out of that? 
if you recall at the beginning, I said that one of my main questions that was bugging me is, what is their social position? Where are they located in this social world? Always in relation to others. So where are they in relation to other, to older moms or to more resourceful mothers? So if we look at the results of the media analysis, uh, we'll find something about their social positioning. So it, to understand that, uh, I searched the media and I found 25,463 results about the young mothers experiencing housing issues or with low resources. Of all those, I reviewed only 45. The other ones were not relevant, although it's, it's surprising, but they were. So only 45 media artifacts uh, were, I, were fully reviewed, and I included 15 of those. All came from printed media, YouTube, video, uh, Vimeo, and blogs. Results from the analysis of these media, as well as from my reflections on the initial experiences of recruiting participants, but I mentioned that those difficulties to, um, to find them, these show the symbolic violence that is exerted on young mothers who have low resources. Symbolic violence is that uh, are the unconscious modes of domination that happen daily without people noticing it. So in plain language, it's when we find normal or natural something that is violent to somebody. And to identify that, sometimes you need to reverse the situation. And when you reverse the situation, you see that that wouldn't be okay for other people. So that's when that violence is revealed. This is an act of domination, or again, an act of violence that happens with the complicity of both actors. Complicity, not blame at all. So young mothers are marginally positioned from the not so, in relation to the not so young mothers. They are silent and invisible in two different ways. They, first, they are not present in the media artifacts. It's difficult to find them in the media. And if they are present, it's only, or it's usually in a negative way. So they are shown as mothers, they are portrayed as mothers who don't have the skills to mother because they are too young, or they have low chances to succeed in life. Succeed, again, in terms of what the media portrays. They are also misrepresented in the media. They are seen as a social threat sometimes. They are rare, they are deviant, and sometimes in the words of the printed media, they are perceived as lost youth. If we look and we use produce concept of habitus, in the analysis, we see, or I saw, their predispositions of their positions. Well, what? So this takes the form in two stories that we saw in the media. We saw in the media unexpected stories of success. And we saw also stories of marginalization in public spaces, like the one I explained when mm, I show you the, the drawing of the show. So they are unexpected stories of, of success. That's very interesting. How a story of success is unexpected? It's because it shows how the social expectations for a young mother that she will not succeed and explains how they are positioned as much as advantage than others. Also, and as a contradiction to this, this type of stories conceptualize success as attending university or as attending college, as graduation, and not as they are raising their children. This tells us about the social value given to education and to motherhood for young women. If we look at the stories of the young women and of the participants, and we look at the interviews, and we look also at their social positioning, we look at all the artwork and also the observations, and using again Bourdieu's concept, we find that the daily routines of the participants and how these routines relate to how they access and use the health resources are crucial. What do they do when they need to see healthcare for themselves and their children? This is shaped by their daily lives. The activities they do during an ordinary day are oriented towards their concerns, which are going to school, attending programs, mainly parenting programs if they are older, and taking care of their babies and sometimes they extended family. 
Their stories show, show them as dedicated to caring for their babies. They adopt the role of the caring mother who assumes responsibility of the family at a very young age. So as one of my participants explained, so she said, my ordinary day. An ordinary day, I wake up, I jump in the shower, I wake up my brother so they can get dressed for school. Then I wake up and dress my baby and I come to school on the subway. To school, I mean to high school. I will pick them up later from the school bus and I will cook food for them so they can eat. So after that, she also explained that she had to take care of her mother because her mother was not at home a lot. And when she came home, it was very late. So she had to also take care of the mother. In this story, I found unique the image of this caring and responsible mother who dedicates all her time to others, although it's not necessarily presented as an individual choice. This is a narrative of embodied mothering corresponding to a social idea. And as this one, their narratives or my participants' narratives reflected an, an idealized image of the embodiment of motherhood. But this contrasts what, what they value as the lifestyle of an 18 years old girl. In their reflections, also, they brought up the message of the disruption occurring between the value of being a mother and caring for the family and not finding the safety and support that family is expected to provide. So what else was in their daily lives? In their daily lives, we found what I call programs and textbooks and bottles, bottles for feeding their babies. So younger participants spent most of the day in high school and older participants spent most of the day in um, attending parenting programs, attending parenting programs that gave them the symbolic capital of being perceived as Caring mothers that want to get better and want to get the skills that supposedly they don't have, so they can apply for more stable housing or for finding a job or for just getting some resources. Also, these programs and also some of the programs took, took place after um, high school when they finished at 3.30. So these programs are a source of resources for them. So for example, as one of my participants explained, she said, there would be a weekend that I only have food for two days. And when Monday starts, I don't have anything to give to my son. So I look forward to go to those programs because they help me. For example, yesterday I was running out of the uppers. And today I don't have the money to buy the uppers for my daughter. But I know that if I go to that program, they would be able to provide them for me. So those resources help me sometimes and I don't struggle to the point where I don't have anything because I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So the value attached to these programs and also to high school, it's very loaded. One more thing before I move to the, to the next question, or to, to the next, to the next uh, issue is that also, education at high school, it was a very important capital for them. It was not a choice because, again, for getting access to resources and to housing, for example, they needed uh, to get engaged in high school, although maybe they didn't graduate. But this also tells us about the value that society puts in education. So I want to read you one of the stories from one of the participants. When I asked her about, what about your future, what about high school? She said, I'm going to college, for sure. And once I graduate college, I'm going to go to work. And then I'm going to go to work and make my family happy. I'm going to prove everyone wrong. Everyone who said they couldn't do it or who adopted me. It's going to be awesome. Another thing is that my boyfriend is going to be in school too when I go to school. So we will probably be in school at the same time. So then, like if he's in school, what am I supposed to do with my child? And there was a long silence. It was difficult for me to handle, but I didn't want to add anything. So in this narration of the desired future, the participant realized of the difficulties to achieve 
a dream to keep what everybody expected from her and to keep also what she knew would help her to move to a better social position. So this was hard to overcome. So my participant fell in a deep silence. After that, the interview was over. We went just to eat out to eat cookies. She realized that there were not many chances to accomplish her dream and her hopes suddenly vanished. Earlier in this interview, she expressed suffering and she expressed oppression before acknowledging that education is a socially valued credential that can open access to a better position. But her silence after explaining this was heavy and dense. A silence that I interpreted as the fate of a dream that belongs to youth. A dream that seems to slip out from the young mothers who are trapped in a circle that might easily perpetuate their lack of resources and marginalized position. Based on Bourdieu's reflections, what is clear for me from this case is that the social order creates social suffering in young mothers, whether they internalize the structure consciously or unconsciously. And how is that related to health practices? Because you might still remember that I was interested in health practices and healthcare. So the health practices of my participant and these young women were totally a reflection of their daily lives. There, were, there was a total connection. It was not separate. One thing was a mirror of the other. So I asked one of the participants, what do you do when you have a health issue? I said, well, I go to the eMERGE. said, you go to the eMERGE? Like, yeah, I don't. Well, I do have a doctor, but I don't like him that much. I don't really feel comfortable with him. So I feel it's not the same. So maybe we'll look for a new family doctor. I asked another one. She said, yeah, I do have a family doctor, but he doesn't know I'm pregnant. I haven't gone to him. I just thought that just, I don't want to be judged. So the daily activities that I explained previously offer this sense of complexity that locates the individual actions in the broader sense. This feeling of being judged in the daily life, it's also, it also reproduces again in feeling judged when they seek for health. Overall, a paradoxical gap emerges in the healthcare system, an assistant that is contextualized, contextualized to provide care to vulnerable populations becomes a reflection of the social marginalization. The mom's predisposition to mother and this embodied social ideal of what it means to be young results, though, in a creative habitus that pursues the acquisition of social capital. So they try to find, they find networks, they find supporting family or supporting figures, and they find cultural capital, like school and higher education. All these to gain symbolic capital, that recognition that may put them in a more privileged social position. The mom that did this, this beautiful artwork said, people stare at you like you have five heads. Even though it's something, I think it's so common. Before women had babies so young, like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and they are still having babies in other countries when they are young. But here in Canada, it's different. There's people who look at it like there's a way you have to go through life. Finish high school, go to university, fall in love, get married, have kids, that's a typical. And that's probably a successful way to do it. But not everyone's life is like that, right? So some things are jumbled, but that doesn't mean you won't get the end a result of success. I know people that they stare, stare at you and they judge you because there are lots of teen moms who are not good examples of teen moms. But there are also lots of adults that are not good examples of being a parent, so it's not fair to judge. But people do it anyways. And people always stare at you, or people always say, oh my gosh, you're so young, how old are you? So in this conversation, this mom explained how her mother was also a young mom. She presented in a unique way the relation between being too young to mother, having a predisposition to, to being a young mom, the social suffering of feeling watched and judged, and also the symbolic violence that accepting again her difference from other mothers and justifying the possibilities of success. 
this picture it's a very special one it came from a participant that she didn't want to be identified at all so she did not let me record the conversations we had but she said clara please make sure that my picture goes out there i want people to see my story and i want people to see how i feel for being a young mom and that's helped for me she said she said that's helped for me because in my real life at the top that's how everybody treats me that i'm too young i did something really wrong i got pregnant when i was 15. so it's bad but nobody understands that for me for my mental health my baby is at the core and that's the only thing that counts and she said for me health is the same than my daily life and just i'm almost done two more minutes that's also a very special picture and she said it was a very special participant and she said we all have problems but young mothers for young mothers is worse and that's what she painted as a summary of what i've been just telling you the stories and the social positions that i've been telling you their health practices are informed by social norms and values that are attributed to a constructed ideal of what a mother is. And this is shaped at the same time by the participants' acceptance and the embodiment of the social problem problematization of being a your mother. Again, there's no linear relation here. But it's a net of forces that carve a pathway to youth. This art piece keeps the visual and verbal content in balance for me. What words cannot convey and evoke, this image for me it does. It allows us to see, illuminating the invisible, instead of looking at the data. The theoretical concepts might be inter interpretatively brought into being when seeing young mothers' visual reflective expressions of their health practices to use health resources. So again, I don't want to repeat myself, but the paradoxical gap emerges of this of a system that is contextualized, conceptualized to provide care to vulnerable populations becomes a reflection of the social marginalization. And the use of the healthcare system conforms to social values. It's not an isolated system, and we are not out of this system. Although moms push back through their practices of resistance. And just a quick reflect, reflection, now that you've seen all the stories about arts-based methods and how did it work and what did you see or what is the takeaway from that? I would, see, I would say embrace a lack of control if you use arts-based methods. Just embrace it and you don't get, that's how it works and that's what makes it work. So I say lack of control, but I don't say lack of structure. So it's not the same. <laughs> so there's a minimum. So as you saw, we started drawing, drawing, painting, and knitting. I said, why knitting? I didn't explain the knitting piece, but knitting piece was very important to just be present because at the beginning, even the workshops well felt like violent. Like we're here, we have to draw. I don't want to draw. I have a complicated life. Nobody wants me. I don't want to draw. Like boom, chop. They started knitting, and knitting was perfect because you need for two weeks you connect with the person you're sitting with. You want to talk, you talk where you need. You don't want to talk, you need. I didn't choose knitting. I mean, I don't even you even think about knitting. They started knitting, so I brought all my amazing supplies, my two artists, amazing table, and then we're sitting there. Nobody was drawing. I was drawing by myself. I'm like, oh my god, my PhD, <laughs> <laughs> and then. One of the volunteers, the childcare workers, he said, do you mind? Like, no, whatever. He just started knitting. And the moms were like, can I need to? Like, I don't know what to need. And another one, oh, I used to need when I, let's knit together. And after a few weeks of knitting, we were painting and doing far more, but um, different things. So please embrace the lack of control because it's okay to feel uncomfortable when you do as be research. It's okay, it's okay not to be in control. And it's okay to accept uncertainty. In fact, it is not only okay. I would say that that's one of the little switches that, if I may say, I'm like, I'm allowed to say that we need to do in research. Like, 
embracing all that is the way of moving forward and finding methods that really help us to understand the complexities of the social world that we have. And this not only applies for arts based methods, I mean, embrace being uncomfortable and not being in control and accept uncertainty also when you do randomized control trials. <laughs> so there's a new way and we have to keep adapting to the reality and to the changes that mm, we as researchers and academics are, are experiencing. Mm -hmm. But there are risks to that. So that doesn't come free. It's not as many things, it's not a magic pill or it's not a perfect approach. There are many risks that don't have time to discuss, but I'm also happy to, <laughs> to discuss a later point. But for managing these risks, I think they are, there's one key thing, and that's build community. So share the work that you do. Explain to other colleagues that do similar work, or that maybe they don't do similar work to yours, but they might understand. Give it a try. You will be surprised of how people that think differently than yourself they understand what you do. So build community with people that are like you or that they are not like you. And obviously I'm inviting you to build community with me, please. So please, you want to write down my email and my Twitter user. The one on the left is my Twitter. It's very strange. I mean, you might not remember, but Andrea retweeted me, so you can find me there. But please build community for critical space methods. Mm -hmm.